What's the craziest thing you've ever seen as a cardiologist? During my fellowship, during the middle of COVID, I had a 22-year-old male came in. He was fluid overloaded, chest pain, shortness of breath, really acute onset. He came in. He came in through an Uber because he didn't have a way to actually get to the hospital. So Whoa. that was the first start. And he said he didn't really have any family who wanted to come with him at the time. But we did an echocardiogram on him. And at the time, I was still practicing my echo skills. So I actually was the first one to do an unofficial echo on him. And I saw that his, his ejection fraction, how much his heart was pumping, was like 10%. And I was Whoa. like, wow. Yeah. So we get I got an official echo from the sonographers, but then I started, you know, doing the history with them. And he told me he had just been diagnosed with COVID maybe three weeks before, but he said he had been doing okay for the most part, but then slowly progressively became more short of breath, started gaining weight and then put on some fluid, so which has made, which made him come to the hospital. So the next day I come in and as I'm coming, I'm on nights at this time. And like, I just hear everybody, all the nurses are in this one room. And I realize, oh, that's, that's my boy's room. What's going on? So I go, and they're intubating him. Uh, and, and I'm like, oh, what's going on? What's going on? And it's like, yeah, he just he just wasn't he wasn't doing well. He became more hypoxic, and he became, his lactate was rising. So long story short, he ended up going on ECMO. And he was on ECMO for about... For the, for, for the, tell, tell, tell the users what ECMO is. Oh, so ECMO is uh, a system that essentially pumps blood to your body and to your organs when your heart can't. It is basically gives your heart a rest. It allows your heart to rest while it does what your heart is supposed to do when it can't. So he was on that, and which is heavy duty stuff. He was on that mm -hmm. for about three days, but and then he eventually we were able to get him off ECMO, we extubated him, and he left the hospital probably a week later. His ejection fraction was back to normal. Let's go. That was who I was. My emotions was up and down that whole like week, just dealing with him because I'm like, you're 22, like you, you don't want to see the worst in a 22 year old. But his recovery was remarkable. And Man, I love when you started the story off and you said that you said 22 years old and 10 percent ejection fraction. Like the whole time I'm just waiting to see, man, is he gonna live or die? Live or die? Live or die? So right. he made it. So you made it, yeah. This is a, this is a, a story with a happy ending. So let's go, man. Thank you, thank you for starting it off like that. Let's go, man. Right. You know, I ain't trying to start off all depressed and stuff. So thank you for doing that. So hey, no what's up, fam? What's up, fam? This uh, Dr. Dale. This is the Black Men and White Coast Podcast. And today, man, super excited about this episode. Um, you know, it's a guy I've known for a golly, I guess since 2016. It must be so, Dr. Eddie Heckler the Third. Um, trained at UT Southwestern Medical Center where I did my fellowship as well and we were there together for some years and that was going to do some crazy amazing stuff and it's really impacting the world in very unique ways and we're going to get into that but give you a little hint his social Instagram is the black doctor the black doctor so y'all can check that out and make sure you guys follow but you guys will see kind of how he's impacting the world and we're going to talk about it all right so hit that subscribe button and we're going to dive right into the show all right so the next question I want to ask you right you know, we, we go through medical school. We have our short, when you're in medical school, you have the short white coat and you're like, you're, you're kind of a play doctor. You graduate mm -hmm. med school, you start internship and you get a long white coat, which means, hey, you made it. You're a real doctor. So what was your welcome to medicine moment when you got that long white coat? I would say intern year at UT Southwestern. I was at Clements Hospital, my first MICU rotation ever in life. <laughs> And it's my first call shift. So mind you, as an intern, your call shift is about 5 a.m. to about 7 p.m. you're supposed to leave. And it was, it was a day, for sure. And it was about 11 p.m. at night. And I'm still there, <laughs> typing notes, trying to do things. And my fellow at the time came in like, oh, my God, you're still here. We have to get you home. And I'm like... <laughs> I'm trying to get home. I promise you. <laughs> I don't want to stay here overnight and then just not sleep, but it's, it's looking like it's going to be that type of night. But anyway, I left at midnight, came back at 4.30 a.m. the next day because I had to round on oh everyone I just saw four hours ago. And that was the moment I realized, like, you know what? Yeah, yeah, I'm really in this. This is real. <laughs> it's not oh, fake. Yeah. 
Uh, and hey, hey, let, me, let me let me put this out. That is uh, it's, it's not really like that's not the norm. That's not the regular anymore. Right? He's he just thought I gotta say that, man, because these you know these um what did, what did you call them? The, the police the the um the credentialing police as I like to call them are gonna come by and say that we're violating duty. It's not like that. It's not Jay really Cole like that. and everybody else. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a one time deal. That was welcome to medicine. That was a brand new doctor. Not like yeah. that. All right, man, I wasn't yeah, but, fishing at the time. That's what it was. That's what. Yeah, and 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 the Mickey, you know, the the Mickey, the Mickey will get you, man. The Mickey, the Mickey will make you work, make you work, man. All right, so Cle- Cleveland, Ohio. I'm, I'm gonna take your story way back. We're gonna go through go through your life story here. Cleveland, Ohio. You know, I went to Cleveland for the first time. For you were just we were just talking about this before we started. Um, you know, one of my black men at White Coast Youth Summits. I went to Cleveland, and when I think about Cleveland. The outside world, right? A lot of the people who grew up in the 90s hip-hop culture. When we think about Cleveland, take a guess. What do you think I'm going to say? What do we think about first? Bone Thugs and Harmony. Bone Thugs and Harmony, man. Bone Thugs and Harmony. So you got, so you got, you got to tell me, what was it like growing up in Cleveland during the, the Bone Thugs and Harmony era? So I had young parents. So the benefit of that is that I got to listen to probably a lot of things that I probably shouldn't have listened to. And Bone Thug was one of them. So growing, growing up in elementary school and middle school, we uh, everybody knew all the words to all the Bone Thugs and Harmony songs. And whenever they came on, you got it. You, you had to put on for the city. And I think one memory I have specifically is Crossroads being like the song for a long time just that in Cleveland, if you heard it, like everybody's dropped what they were doing to sing the song. And I, I performed it at a talent show. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Eddie had yeah. the third perform, yeah. performing Look, Crossroads. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But needless to say, they 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 cut me short. They said, All right, after about <laughs> yeah, after about a minute, they're like, Okay, this is probably not what we thought it was gonna be. So <laughs> What do you mean like like they thought it was inappropriate or what? I think they thought that it was too inappropriate for the setting. So, cause I guess it, it, so my my middle school was also attached to an elementary school, so we kind of it was like K through eight. So you had like kindergartners and first graders. So I don't think they really wanted to expose them to that type of music at the time. But I, yeah, I, I, I really like this visual of imagining a young Dr. Eddie Hackler on stage just rapping Crossroads. They're gonna miss everybody. You know? Did, mm-hmm. did you um? Did you? Did what was your what did your hair look like? Don't tell me you had the braids and did you have, did you have all that too? Uh-oh. No, I never had braids. I've always had probably the same cut I have now. Nice little fade on the side, a little low cut. So what, <laughs> I, had what, part, I had a part in the middle of my head though at the time though. Oh, you yeah, had the Safar Marbury, Larry Johnson yes, part. Um, what 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 were you wearing for that? Were you wearing like um like khakis and a blue shirt? What what were you rocking on that? So I definitely had my school uniform on. So yeah, it was, was khakis, cool. blue shirt. We couldn't dress down for the talent show, unfortunately, but. Oh man, that's classic. That's classic. Yeah. So, so hey, hey, so so first of all, message to the little kids out there, just let you know, like we grew up just like y'all did, the same stuff. Y'all's current, what is it nowadays? Little baby, little Dirk, and all that stuff. Yeah. You know, we had our <laughs> versions, and we grew up rapping them, talent shows, all that stuff that, that y'all do, y'all do right now. So, you know, um, okay, okay, let's start with your parents then. Um, mm-hmm. You said your parents, you had young parents. Mm-hmm. Um, what what was the tone in your household, right? So. Um, you had young parents, obviously, let you listen to Bone Thugs and Harmony and stuff. And, you know, you, you perform Bone at the talent show. So it gives me an idea as to what type of people your parents might have been. But what was the, the academic tone, the educational tone? Was it like, hey, Eddie, you better do well in class? Or was it was that kind of driven by you? You just always were somebody who was self-driven? So what I will say is that I had a village around me. So I had... Godparents, uncles, aunts, grandparents, along with my parents, who everybody just poured into me. So I think from that I got a little bit of everything from everyone. So my my mom and dad split very soon after I was born. So it was pretty much my mom and me and my siblings. And then I would see my I would see my father like spring break, summer break, Christmas breaks. And then my younger brother, his father, was like my second father, I would see him like pretty much every weekend. And between my dad, my brother's father, who was basically my father too, and my mother, it was always like, hey, you're smart. Be, use that to your advantage and continue to learn and always be curious about things. So it's been drilled into me since I was very young that knowledge and education is the key to success. And I took that to heart. And decided to use that as my foundation moving forward. 
I love that. I love that. Let me let me ask you this question. So, you know, thinking of taking this to a societal social standpoint. So, you're so you grew up. I guess you, I don't know if you call a single parent. I guess single parent. I'm not sure how long your um your younger brothers, um dad was was around there. Yeah. The the male role model. Tell me about that. Where where did your male ro- mo- role model come from? Like, because you mentioned them, your your birth dad and your um, I don't know what you want to call them, your second dad or whatever your your brother's dad. You mentioned both of them were kind of around, but they weren't around all the time consistently. So, how did you get? Where did that male role model come in into your your life? I think it was just a combination of both. Truly, I think I took certain characteristics from my dad, certain characteristics from my brother's father. And I think it helped mold me into the man that I am today. And I, yeah, those, those, those are my role models truly growing up. Then. Nice. nice. So, so, you know, everybody's telling you you're smart. Hey, you know, you, you can do, you can do whatever you want. When did the idea of medical doctor, when, when what happened to you? What's the story behind like, Hey, you know what? I might want to be a medical doctor. So my little brother, my little brother is four years younger than me. So I'm the oldest of all my siblings. Always been told, hey, your siblings are your responsibility, essentially, <laughs> growing up. So it was always my, it was my duty to protect him, make sure he got home, make sure he ate, all those things. He had really bad asthma. And he would frequently have like asthma attacks to the point where, okay, we had to go to the hospital to, for him to get treatment and feel better. And those were the only moments where I felt like helpless. Like, oh man, there's nothing I can do for Stefan because like he's having an asthma attack. I don't know what to do. We got to get him to the hospital. We would go to the hospital. The doctors would see him. They would fix him. He would feel better. And after the second or third time that that happened, I'm like, man, I want to be able to do what they're doing for my brother, for him. And it was at that moment that I decided, you know what? I'm going to be a doctor. That's what I'm going to do in my life so that I can help people. But it stemmed from my brother having asthma. I love it, man. And, you know, and that's, that's how a lot of this stuff really happens. A lot of stuff really works. You know, you, you look around you, you see something that you don't deem to be right in life. And then you say, Hey, I want to do something about it. And that was something very simple for you. I feel like I've heard that story. We must've talked about that this before. I've heard that exact story. And like you tell, tell that story before. Um, Cause in my mind, first thing I'm thinking about is why didn't you go into pulmonary medicine? But we're going to get it. We're going to, we're going to get, we're going to get into that a little bit later on. We're going to get into that a little bit later on. So, so how old are you when you hit this realization that you want to be able to help people like your brother? I would say probably, I, I used to say five years old, but I wasn't five. I probably was like nine, 10 when I nine. actually made that realization. All right, so so tell me tell me this then. Once you made that realization, did that do you remember did that impact you in any way to say, hey, I'm gonna take school more seriously? Or did it change anything you were doing on a day-to-day basis? Or were you kind of like too young to realize what it what it was? And it was just kind of a dream. So actually, no, I went to a Montessori school and what a Montessori school kind of builds itself upon is independence and kind of teaching children how to learn independently with some guidance. So it really didn't change much for me because I was kind of already in like an independent space. It just gave me a direction. So. Nice, nice, nice. So, so it sounds like it sounds like from the get go, that village, the school, everything. You were kind of on this on this um, path as as a youth. I'm still talking about that that kind of young age, nine, ten, maybe up to eleven, twelve um, years old. What kind of kid were you? I know about the bone stuff, but were you? Would you say you were more more? Hey. I'm a book nerd. I'm in the books reading. Uh, did you have a sport? Were you into, you know, dancing? Um, I know you now, so I so I, I know you about your fashion, man. I know you about your fashion. <laughs> like, were you into that back then, too? Uh, like, what kind of kid were you? I would say I was, uh, like, I was a very happy kid, hyper, probably like most kids. I... I wasn't necessarily like a bookworm or a nerd per se, because honestly, a lot of things just came easy to me, but I also wasn't too far from that either. I ran track starting in middle school and that was one of my biggest passions was running track. So I did that. And in order to run track, you had to get good grades. So it all kind of tied together. And I think that kind of just propelled my childhood is when I started running track because then now I have like that that internal discipline 
from something that I enjoy and not just externally from my parent parental figures. It's more so like, okay, this is something that I want and what do I have to do to get better at that? And then aligning my life around that. I love that. So, you know, um, a lot of times what you find is a lot of, not even just not even black boys or black individuals, a lot of everybody somewhere along the journey to have either sports or entertainments as something they wanted to do. But that track, is that something or entertainment, is that something you wanted to do at the highest level, like go professional and do that stuff? Or those things you just knew, hey, I'm doing it just, you know, just for the time being. Like for, for me, you know, if you go back and read stuff I wrote when I was eight years old, I talked about being a doctor already. However, I still wanted to go to the NBA for the longest time. Um, did you have one of those dreams as well to align with wanting to be a doctor as well? Oh, yeah. I, I wanted to go to the Olympics. Like I wanted to be the next Michael Johnson. <laughs> I wanted to run. Um, whatever race I was running, kick my shoes off, <laughs> on fire. <laughs> Let me put it out. Like I, I wanted that for sure. I got injured my, I want to say my junior year of high school. I pulled my hamstring running hurdles. And that recovery was tough. And I think it was at that moment I realized, you know what? I probably won't be able to make it to the Olympics being realistic about everything. But it was still a passion of mine that I continued afterwards. So, so how how good were you? I was I was decent. I was I was never a state champion singly in my in my event, but I definitely used to make it to like the championships and to those heats. I was always in the fastest heat. Um, people started to know who I was because they knew, oh, he, he's one of the hurdlers. Our high school, we all were. Our high school in general was just good for track and field. I think we were indoor state champions. And then outdoor state champions. So people knew who our high school was. So I was the hurdler for my high school who was really good. Yeah, so you were legit. When you start talking about when you start talking state around, that gives you that makes you legit. And then once you say champion after the word state, that, that whatever those words come together, you know, you know you got it for real. Um legit. So college. Remind me, where where did you go to college on the grad? I went to Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. Okay, so the decision, the decision for the college you picked, you know, this is something where, you know, I get kids come to me and they talk to me. I, and I like this one specifically for you because I know you went to Meharry for med school, which is HBCU. Yeah. Um, Bowling Green is not HBCU, is it? PWI. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so tell me, tell me about the decision, the thing that made you choose that particular school. What things did you take into consideration? I wish I had this grand story for you. I actually have a funny story, if you don't mind me telling the funny hey, story. Hey, funny is better than grand sometimes. Okay. Um, so it all boiled down to money at the end of the day, but initially I only wanted to go to Morehouse and I, I applied to Morehouse and I applied to some other schools outside of Ohio. And my counselor at the time was, Hey, I want you to apply to one, one Ohio school that can be your safe school. But you know, me at that time, I'm like, oh, I have a 4.0 GPA. Like I got, I, I did pretty good on my SAT and I, I think I'd be able to go wherever I want to go. So I said, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. I always wanted, I knew I didn't want to stay in Ohio. I wanted to go somewhere and just kind of explore the world. So I got accepted to Morehouse, of course, had a roommate, had a dorm, everything. But I only had a half ride to go. So they gave me 50% of the money that I needed. One day I was in AP Biology and it was like a free, free period for us during that part of the school year because we were pretty much done. And we were watching the video. We were supposed to be taking notes. So I didn't feel like taking notes, but my friend, she was applying to Bowling Green. She had a paper application and she's like, well, just fill out this application. I have an extra one. Just fill it out. Act like you're taking notes. So I'm all right. All right I'm going to do that. So filled it out. Look, I realized I didn't, need, I didn't need an essay. So I was like, oh, this could be my Ohio school that I can get to my counselor. That way she's satisfied. So I filled it out in AP Biology, turned it in. They would send off all, all our applications. I forgot all about this whole situation. One day I got my mail, I got some mail back. One from Bowling Green said, Oh, you've been accepted to Bowling Green. I was like, all right, cool, cool, you know. I was like, all right, cool. Then maybe about two weeks later, I got a, a mail some mail from Bowling Green again. Cha -ching. And it stated that, oh, you have a full ride to go <laughs> to Bowling Green. So I'm like, oh wow. I'm like, that's crazy. So of course, you know, I tell my dad. I was like, hey, I got a full ride to go to Bowling Green. I'm like, I wish Morehouse would give me a full ride. So then at this point, I mean, we're thinking two different things. I'm thinking like, oh, that's crazy. 
I don't have a full ride to go to Morehouse, but I would have had a full ride to go to Bowling Green. He's thinking, well, I'm not sending you to Morehouse with a 50% <laughs> scholarship. If you got a 100% scholarship, go somewhere else. So that's initially basically how I end up choosing Bowling Greens because they gave me a full ride to go. I'll tell you my story. <clears throat> Excuse me. My story is very similar to that. Very similar to that. So um, I wanted to go to Xavier in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have the summer program, this phenomenal summer program, Howard Hughes deal. So I went to the summer program, um, you know, had a blast. I'm like, man, I'm going to Xavier. No question about it. You know, you know, it was like looking around, everybody looked like me. The, 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 the uh, the girl, the guy ratio at that time was like nine to one. Right. So like, man, I'm going to Xavier. I was trying to get on the basketball team. I, I was, you know, um, we go to practice with the basketball squad. They're killing them, you know, and, and. Same thing. I got like a health scholarship or something. What I don't remember what it was, but it wasn't the whole thing. Uh, University of Missouri sends something in the mail. Um, little thing about apply for the scholarship. I don't think I even applied to the school. I think it was all kind of together. Some little thing sent that thing in. Boom, college paid for. It, you know, and I'm thinking the same thing. I'm over here thinking like, man, that stinks. I'm going to Xavier, man. Yeah, I'm going to Xavier. That's things that I couldn't go take. That my parents like, uh, uh-uh, uh, not happening. That's you were going to Missouri. <laughs> Right. Look, our path is, is definitely not linear. It's never the way that we expect it to, but it definitely leads us the way we should be. <laughs> and, and that goes to talk about the importance of parents, man. Having parents to, who look it up for you, you know, save you, you know, the loans and stuff that we're not. You're not even thinking about when you're a kid, but then you got parents to kind of help guide you and stuff like that. So, how how was your time at um, Bowling Green? Um, were you pre med right off the bat? What, the, what extracurriculars were you a part of? Yeah, so Bowling Green, I enjoyed it. I loved it. Met some amazing people, some amazing friends. I was pre-med right off the bat. Everybody knew that I wanted to be a doctor. It was like, it was a thing. Like, okay, yeah, you know, Eddie, he wants to do, he wants to be a doctor. He's going to be a doctor. Like, that's that. And that kind of was just kind of one of my identities there when I was at Bowling Green. Eventually, um, I became a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. And then from there... So let's, let's 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 pause on that because that, that's something that's actually important. So a lot of people will get to college and they'll talk about you know um, should they ple- should they pledge or should they not pledge. Mm-hmm. Um, as a pre medical student, right? I, it's not easy, you know. Mm-hmm. You got to go through all this stuff, and I don't know what year you pledge, but uh, what, no matter the year, some years harder than others. But no matter the year, it's still not going to be easy. Your decision to pledge, tell us about that. And then how challenging was it when you actually, you know, went through your pledge in addition to trying to do your pre-med work? So my initially, when I first came to college, I had an idea that I did want to pledge. <clears throat> but my freshman year, I kind of wanted to take my time and kind of just like do my more, do my research, kind of just feel everything out. And eventually... I was reading up on Alpha Phi Alpha, and I realized that they were the first black fraternity, and it was founded on a PWI's campus in, the, in an effort to bring black people together when it was at a time where it was basically black people being trying to be shoved out. So it was a way to bring everybody together, and I, that stuck with me probably the most. And that's when I decided to kind of put my foot out there. Um, the brothers on the Bowling Green campus, they they we, 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 they pretty much ran a yard, which means that they were like, Is that what the cap- uh, if, I, if I go talk to if I go talk to a capital with the Bowling Green when you were there, they, what are they gonna say? They gonna say yeah, the office run a yard. For real? <laughs> yeah, they're gonna say that. I'm gonna, I'm mean, gonna, so I'm gonna like, find one. Everything everything comes in waves and when I was there the alphas that we had we had the waves. But before I was in the alpha, the alphas they were the ones doing the community service, doing the events, doing community service. So throwing the parties, like they had their hand in all of that. And I also like, they were just, just very distinct. Like it wasn't very flashy, not, you know, doing the most for attention, kind of just like real chill about their business. And that stuck out to me because I felt like that resonated who I was. So decided to pledge. Um, it, it was very tough, especially being a biology pre-med major. And I was a sophomore at the time. So I think I probably, during the time when I was doing it, I wasn't taking a lot of credit hours and that made it a little easier. And then I had, then I had friends in my same classes who would definitely help me out as well. So that helped a lot. I mean, I did get the only C I ever got in undergrad, probably I think in my whole 
career was during that time taking organic chemistry. But I feel like people get a C in organic chemistry, whether they're they're pledging, whether they're fully attentive or not. So yeah, it was during that time, but. So that's going to be a silly question. Um, Mm -hmm. Would you or would you not recommend it to you know the next generation? You got a young high school kid listening to this, maybe, mm-hmm. and just they're thinking they want to go to whatever college and and pledge. Would you? I imagine you can say yes. You recommend this. Let me rephrase the question: When during the pre med process do you think it's best to do that? I don't think there's a specific point. I think you need to take a step back and look. Say, hey, these are my goals. And how do I fit joining an organization into that? And you figure out from your own trajectory what makes the most sense. You know, some people, it takes them five years to graduate. Some people graduate in four. If if you have a hard stop on four, then you got to figure out maybe doing it a little earlier. If, if you can stretch it out to five, if that's what you're interested in doing and taking your time, then that works too. But you have to make a decision that you're going to be content with and satisfied with. And then also a decision that you won't look back and say, Oh, I regret that I did or did not do this. What was the, what was the most difficult thing for you during you know, those college years? So what was the hardest t- I mean, What was the hardest time period? What was the hardest thing you struggled with as a pre-med? I think the first time I took the MCAT, I was in a junior and I, I did horrible. Horrible. I don't know what the lowest score is, but I probably that I probably got that score. <laughs> and going to talk to my counselor, and my counselor telling me like, "Hey, maybe you should think about something different," or you know, I wouldn't apply with this score. So coming to face that realization, like, "Oh yeah, your dream may not necessarily come true because you didn't do well on this test." Luckily, I was very tenacious. I'm like, "No, nah, I just feel like it's gonna work out for me." So I actually applied with that score across like probably like 15 different schools. And I got like, I got three interviews and one was at Meharry Medical College. And I did not get into Meharry Medical College from with that score, but I did get into a post back program that they had. And the post back program allowed you to retake the MCAT and then also do some coursework and you have to get a certain GPA. And if you did a, if you did it well in the coursework and you did well in the MCAT, you basically had an acceptance into the class that following year. So if I had listened to my counselor and not applied, who knows what would have happened, but I definitely would not have gotten to that post back program, which I think I probably needed it more of that time to kind of like really get to know myself and really understand how do I study? How do I learn? prior to really starting medical school. And then I met some of my best friends to this day in that program. So I'm happy that everything worked out the way that it did, but that was definitely the hardest time at Bowling Green for me. Boy, that MCAT, man, that MCAT ripped some stuff up. So then then let's fast forward to Mary. Mary, good place, man. Um, My wife, yeah, Mm -hmm. it's a great place. My wife, my wife, you know, she, she graduated from Mary. So I spent, Tons of time with Meharry, man. I was like, <laughs> tons of time with Meharry. My first, I went to Mizzou for med school, Missouri, but my first two years, you know, the, the way Missouri worked is I think you do classes for like seven weeks. They have a week of testing, you get a week off. So every week off, I was in at Meharry. Mm-hmm. Um, and then fourth year, I was, you know, I, I might have been at Meharry most of fourth year, you know. I was at Meharry like throughout all fourth year. I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm sitting down You're in classes. <laughs> no, like legit. Like, like they, my wife's classmates will text me like, "Hey, Dale, you coming to to the reunion?" And stuff like that. they don't text her; they text me. Like, you gonna be at the reunion? So I'm like, "Hey, I did not. I did my match day at Meharry. Like, I literally, like, I didn't even go to my own match day. I was on stage with my wife at Meharry for the for that match day. You know, it was, I didn't know. Yeah. This. Never had yeah. a conversation with Dale. <laughs> oh, no, we was out the DB DB Todd West Basic. We were out there, man. Oh, man. Um, it was a good place. So I I, I love Meharry. Um. So for the, for the listeners, there's there are four HBCU medical schools um, in the U.S. So um, Meharry, Howard, Morehouse, and um, Drew, um, all good places. Great place to to you know just to go and, and just a good 
it's a good learning environment. So, so I'd like for you to um, kind of expand on that. So tell us about going from the PWI to the HBCU, pros, cons, et cetera. What was, just, what was that whole experience like for you? Well, blankly, it was the best decision I ever made in my life. I had an amazing time, and that I would do over and over again. That decision, I would make that over and over again. I wouldn't do med school over again. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, I think the biggest thing, the biggest hurdle for me going to a HBCU coming from a PWI was, like I told you before, when I went to Bowling Green, everybody knew, like, oh, Eddie, he's going to be a doctor. That's who he is. He's a smart kid, blah, blah, blah. When I went to Meharry, we're all black and we're all smart. So, okay, well, how do you stand out? How do you set yourself apart from the group, you know? And that was kind of, it was more of an identity, not crisis, but it was, it took some reflection on my part to figure out, okay, well, outside of just being smart, who are you? And who do you want to be, more importantly? Hmm. It was at Meharry where I realized, like, oh, okay, I think this is who I want to be and this is what I want to go, what I want to go after. So it was at Meharry that I, I did leadership things in undergrad too. So that wasn't new to me, but I decided to do it again at Meharry. And initially I wasn't going to, but then it kind of just, when something's meant for you, it's going to happen no matter what. I think I became Mr. Meharry, which is a community service position at Meharry. You're like the face of the school, but your goal is to try to set up community service for the school to come and do in the community. So with that position, I got it's kind of like so. Mr. Mary is kind of like in a sense almost like prom king or homecoming king or something like that. Yeah, right? it's like a it's like a campus <laughs> king. So most HBCUs have campus kings. Yeah. And when I tell you things are meant for you, the so I didn't run for the position initially. It was somebody else who ran. They actually, of course, they won, but then they decided that they wanted to transfer to a different school for whatever reason. So they had a reelection. And of course, the first time people were encouraged me to do, it. I'm like, no, nah, I'm cool. I just want to get them out. I want to stay in my books, y'all. The second time around, it was like, look, this don't ever happen. Like, this is meant to be. So I was like, oh, man. So I ran and I got it. And that was when I was like, okay. So after that, my trajectory just kept going up and I kept realizing, like, okay, this is who I want to be. This is what I want to do. And then from there, I became SGA president after that position. And then after that, I was actually a member of the board of trustees my fourth year of medical school and the year after my first year of residency, actually. So I would have to member fly of the board of trustees for what I was the student is the student for, board member. And that's a two year position. That's pretty, that's, that's pretty dope. So, so you got to sit in on these student board member for MMC for all of my Harry. Yeah. Yeah. For two years. Yeah. And so you're sitting there, you get to sit with all these people who, and just learn and just soak all this stuff in from all these big time leaders and stuff. I was a sponge. I was just sitting there like in awe, like, wow, all these decisions that you have no idea is being made when you're studying. Like I'm sitting in on those meetings. And who was, it, the, was, I, was, was Wayne Riley still there or was it Hildreth? Who was the president when you were so there? So it was Wayne, it was Dr. Riley when I was first there and then... Hildreth came, I want to say my, I think my third year. Okay. So yeah, so it was a tr transitional period. By the way, so listeners, go check out. So I did an episode with um, Wy or, um Riley, Dr. Riley, I don't know, a oh, year or two ago. Yeah, yeah, so go check out his episode. He's dropping some gems, man. He, he was dropping some gems. Um, So so that, so that that's phenomenal. If there was, if there was like one thing that you could, change about your time at Meharry? What would that be? That's a hard question. I think, if anything, looking back on it now, I probably would have made it a point to keep the connections that I was making more concrete after I left. I would say that hmm. there was, I don't think there's anything that would change while I was at Meharry. It's probably more so when I left, you know, when you, when you, when you leave med school, you, you're so ready to get out of med school. You don't want to look back. But then after about five or six years, when you're in the real world and you realize like, well, there's no place like the place that I just came from, you have a yearning for it and you want to, you, you want to go back and you want to kind of tap back into that 
setting where everybody that is doing what you're doing looks like you. Like there, it's not many places like that in the world, especially not in the United States. Let me ask you this: What do you think it is about HBCU, HBC, HBCU, med, not just medical schools, but I'm just using medical school because you went to Mary. What do you think <laughs> it is about them that helps people just be so successful afterwards? Like you know, you get all these smart, you know, black kids, not, not and all them are even black, but you get all these smart kids that come there and um and they thrive, they excel. Like a student like you, for example, you said you have a counselor saying that that hey, you and I maybe should consider something else and. Now you're a, a freaking superstar cardiologist who's impacting the world way beyond just the, you know, the um the hospital, right? What is it about these these HBCUs that can do that? They can say, you know, we're gonna take this kid and we're gonna transform and mold him, help him become who he's supposed to be. I think what you just said, we're gonna take this kid and we're gonna mold him. Being molded by people who look like you and care about you, I think allows you to be vulnerable in a place where that allows you to see yourself and then from seeing yourself, try to become the best version of you. And I think being in an environment where you're fostering discipline, but also discipline from a loving perspective, I think you just get to grow exponentially. Like one of my favorite quotes, it says, go and love somebody exactly as they are and watch them grow into the perfect human being or something like that. I feel like by going to an HBCU, you get that love and it's genuine. And from that, you're able to sprout exactly how you're supposed to. And you take that and it carries with you no matter where you go after that. That was my experience. And I think that's experience for a lot of black students who go to HBCUs. You know, I love that. This reminds me, I got I to gotta get on the soapbox on this. Um, I don't get into politics. So people will be like, hey, talk about this on your podcast. I'm like, I, I, I just don't talk about politics, really, um, mm -hmm. on this podcast. And that's because I don't want the focus to ever come off of the idea that this was started as a means to increase diversity in healthcare and black men and white coats and, you know, we, black women, all this stuff. Um, but I don't ever want it to turn to like a politics thing. This is not a political statement thing, but I, my brother sent me... Um, a clip or something with Elon Musk. He had an interview with Don Lemon, Don Lemon a couple of nights ago. And Elon Musk is talking about, um, you know, kind of criticizing DEI efforts. And he says that he thinks, is, I'm paraphrasing, pretty much summarizing what he said, DEI efforts um, in medicine, specifically lowering standards to increase diversity is harmful for our patients and things of that sort. And, you know, hearing you tell this story, and I wanted to make a whole video actually re rebutting what Musk was saying, but I think the issue, what people don't quite understand is nobody's lowering standards, right? Nobody's lowering standards. The, the question that people are asking is, are the current standards the appropriate standards, right? right. Like you just mentioned that you didn't do well in the MCAT. I didn't do too great on the MCAT, um, but I bet you your patients that you're taking care of or happy you're their doctor. You know what I'm saying? I, 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 I can't, and you had it, I have it. You get so many patients who just love you and just so happy that you, you were there to take care of them and such, right? And then if we were to go back and say, hey, you know what? I almost, I might not have made it because that MCAT and, you know, folks like Elon Musk think that the standards were lower for people like me. So when, when it, it's frustrating. And again, I'm not going to get the po political side of it, but, you know, this new bill just got introduced also. People are, pe people are talking about lowering standards. Lower, nobody's lowering standards. The question is, does the MCAT really say, does no, have anything? I got nothing to do with how good of a doctor you're going to be. The, the, the point is we're using the wrong standards, and, and you're the perfect example of this. Because you take a school like Meharry who says, hey, that's not the right standard for producing the doctors you know, society needs. You, we're using the wrong standards, right? And we're going to prove it to you. We're going to prove it to you. Right. Come over here to our med school. These, you know, these schools didn't accept you. Come over here. We're going to prove that we can produce a phenomenal doctor. And, you know, I dare say that, you know, the impact you're having on the world is probably, I, you know, I don't want to like over overstate this, but I would imagine there's more than a whole lot of other cardiologists who have it in the world. Right. Because we haven't gotten to this yet on the episode, but not only you, Dr. Eddie Heckler, the third taking care of patients, in the hospital, clinic, whatever, all, whatever you're doing, 
You're also the black doctor on Instagram who's doing all this public health service work essentially on Instagram and you're educating the, the public at large, you know, and, and, and impact their lives. The MCAT does not measure that. You know, and, and, and uh, this stuff just kills me when, oh, we're lowering, nobody's lowering standards. You're telling, we're telling you the standards are wrong. Like you need to get the right standards and look at people like Dr. Hackler who are actually doing these things, impacting the world. Take somebody like Dr. Heckler, go backwards in his journey and see what boxes were checked off to make him who he is. Those are the standards. Those should be the standards. That's my soapbox, man. My bad. That's my soapbox. That stuff kills me. I agree with you 100, 100%. And I mean, even studies that show that, you know, black people live longer when they're taken care of by black doctors. So to say that, you know, we don't need certain things or we're lowering standards to allow us to get in. And that's that's worse off for patients is completely missing the mark and completely missing the whole point. A lot of racial disparities are because, you know, people don't have access. People don't trust. Where, and where does that come from? People don't trust the medical system, you know, at least from a minority standpoint. So I mean, we can talk about this all day, truly. But like you said, we're using the wrong standards to kind of gauge who's going to be a great doctor and who's not. And so, so a lot of people, you know, you said disparities. People don't have access. Show me how a good MCAT score is going to make access better. I you know, know. It's like, show me that. I, I, I want to, like somebody, somebody needs to show me that, right? All this MCAT score, whatever, boards and all, all that just, and don't get me wrong. Like, yeah, sure. I want, I, I would love for my doctor to do great on the MCAT or whatever. And it's, it's like in, in the Black Men and White Coast documentary, a documentary, if you guys haven't watched it, you can watch it. Members.bmwc event bmwcevents.com. Members.bmwcevents.com. Something like that. <laughs> um, you guys go check it out. You can watch it for free right now. Um, Dr. Mark DeVay says something. He's, he says, you know, I want my doctors to score high on the MCAT, right? Um, cause I want smart doctors. That, that's perfectly fine. He said it's, 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 not, it's not a problem with the test. It's a problem with the way they use the test results. That's the issue. Right? The issue is say, oh, you scored this or you're smarter. That's, that's not how it's supposed to be used. And, and, and that absolutely kills me. Like that's, I could talk, like I said, we talk about this forever. That stuff just absolutely kills me. Um, like even standardized testing has been leaked to racism and even the way that these tests are designed, it's not designed for people like us to do well on these tests. So who's to say that this test is the right one? So. I, mean, I, mean, I mean, it's obvious. There's no, there's no secret around this, right? There is a big um, test prep industry. The test prep industry is there for a reason, right? So it works. People who can afford all test prep stuff, that stuff works. And we can go through this type of stuff, it works. It's obvious that if I can expand... You know, if I can spend more dollars and resources to prepare myself, I'm going to do better. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's just simple. And it's, it's complete bias from that standpoint. And for people to talk about standards, test scores, test scores, that's silly. We know that the test scores don't tell if you're going to be a good doctor. We know that the test scores can be impacts, impacted by how well you're prepared and how well you, you're prepared can be impacted by how much money, how much resources you have. It's, it's right. simple. It's simple. It goes back into social determinants of health. One of them is income and income inequality. You know, a lot of like, I think the average household income for a black family is what, 40,000? Like, who's going to pay for a, a Kaplan course or a Prince Review course if that's what you're you, that's what you're coming in with, and that's what you have to use to survive. And it's just not just you; it's you and your whole family. I mean, you trying to eat, you know, capital or eat? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no yeah, brainer. It's, yeah, it's bad for the patients. Now, what's bad for the patients is not having people who can explain these things to you to be to be to be their healthcare man. So let's um, let's let's kind of jump fast forward, man. Golly, I got a couple more things I want to talk to you about. I know we're going to run short on time here, but um. A couple of key ones that I that I have to have to go with them um, because I'm Southwestern. I got to ask you this question, this one first. Um, well, I got I guess I got to take a step back. I want to get I wanted to get to how you went chose internal medicine, then how you chose cardiology. I'm gonna skip to how you chose internal medicine. No, I'm not. I'm gonna ask it to you. Why internal medicine? So I always enjoy solving puzzles. I've always been like. A I love mysteries, putting pieces together. Internal medicine was that for me in the medical field. Being able to cerebrally think about everything and try to put everything together to synthesize it into, hey, this is what's going on. I've always enjoyed that. Me too, so man. Was, I'm still, 
I'm, I'm still I'm still wondering why if that's the case, I'm still wondering why you didn't do pulmonary and critical care. Your story so far is telling me you should have been pulmonary and critical care. But so because I'm at Southwestern, UT Southwestern, I, I I must ask what led you to choose UT Southwestern Medical Center for your residency. What what decisions went into where you applied to interview all that stuff? Yeah. So what initially even made me look at Texas was that my mom moved from Cleveland to Houston when I was in medical school mm. and. When I was looking for places, I kind of I, I applied broadly, of course, but I looked at Texas because my like, oh, mom's there. I want to, you know, if I could be close to her, that would be cool. And at the time, my brother and my sisters were there too because they were a little younger. But UT Southwestern is so funny. UT Southwestern was my last interview throughout my interview season. I think I went on ten interviews, and I had one place in mind, and it was more so like, oh, they have a good name. I'm gonna go there. That was what I was thinking. Man, I went to UT Southwestern and I didn't want to leave the interview. And I knew at that moment, I was like, so this is the feeling that people have been telling me like, oh, when you when you know, you're going to feel it. And that's how you're going to make your decision. Before I was making a decision based on just like, all right, it's a good place. I'm going to go there versus like, oh, I felt at home there. When I went to UT Southwestern, I felt at home. And that was when I decided to make that decision. I love it. And I know everybody loved you at Southwestern. You were... You know, people always talked about how social you were and things of that sort. You were definitely one of the names that will come up in terms of uh, everybody. Like, oh, I love Eddie. You know, you were, you were, <laughs> I imagine it's the same Mr. Meharry type of thing you, you, you give off. Um, so then cardiology. Why cardiology then? Why not pump crit? I mean, as this, this whole thing started with asthma. That's a pulmonary condition. You want to solve problems. That's critical care, right? So why not pulmonary critical care to the listeners? I'm a pulmonary critical care doctor. That's why I'm, I'm pressing all this. <laughs> but, oh. but why cards? Well, why not Palm Crit? We'll start there. So I don't know if you heard my story about my <laughs> introduction to medicine. And how I was in the MICU till midnight. <laughs> Scarred me for life. So oh, man. <laughs> stir me away quickly from uh, Palm Crit. Group. No, God, we, dropped, we dropped the ball on that one, man. <laughs> so had I left at mid- maybe I had left at 9 p.m., I probably would have went a different route. But no. So cardiology. When I was Mr. Meharry, one of the events that I did was a barbershop initiative mm-hmm. where we went to barbershops and we talked to men about their health. If they went to the doctor and if they did go to the doctor, what they were being treated for or why they didn't go to the doctor. And near D.B. Todd and Jefferson, it's a whole street of barbershops, like one after the other. I, I, I don't know how, how they all stay in business because they're literally like one block, one block, one block. But anywho, went there, did that type of survey and I realized that a lot of men had high blood pressure or diabetes but high blood pressure was the number one and from there I realized that oh high blood pressure diabetes all these things are the biggest risk factors for cardiovascular disease and when I did more research I realized that um, the black population suffers from high blood pressure and rates two times to almost three times as their white counterparts. So for me, cardiology is where I felt that I could do the most good for the most people, but also the most good for my people specifically too. And after that, it was, it was a no brainer for me. So you're, it seems to me a whole, a lot of your journey from the start has been about helping people who come from, you know, places like you and it all starts with some that comes from your own household, your brother. So your whole journey has been driven by helping people. I want to help people like my brother. I want to help, you know, cardiology. I want to help people like, you know, like, like me. Um, where did this passion for, you know, health equity come from? I know you did a, you, you got a health equity um, a certificate um, program. And so where did that passion come from? And then how are you leveraging social media right now for health equity purposes? Yeah, great question. I want to say that before health equity was even a term or anything that I knew, I just wanted to help people. Like I've always wanted to just help people if I could. I love being the person that could do something for somebody else. And I think it speaks testaments to how I was raised, but just being of service. And from that, when I got into the medical space, just realizing that a lot of the things that people that look like us go through are because of health disparities. 
And I decided to do the health policy scholars program because of that. And at Meharry, we, the big push was to help the disadvantaged and to help those communities. So for me, it just made sense with basically who, who I thought I was and who I wanted to be and what I was learning and what I was being exposed to, to also who I saw where I wanted to be too. They all aligned very well. And I decided from that point, okay, I want to take this step and to do a little more and look at ways that how we can change the system to help people that look like us. And, you know, when I was in med school, I had all these dreams of all the different things that I was going to do. And then you get out of med school and you realize, like, oh, wow, this is a lot more work than <laughs> I, gotta, I, gotta I work. ever thought. <laughs> I ever thought. Yeah. So I was already into social media, just like from the fashion standpoint, but I wanted to be more impactful and I wanted to add value to people's lives. And one, one way that I feel like we can help overcome health care disparities is from a public health standpoint. And that's by disseminating information that people need. Everyone doesn't have access to doctors. They don't have access to quality doctors. They don't have access to a lot of different things. So one way, and this is only one small way, was, okay, well, if I can teach people ways that they can prevent heart disease and just disease in general, I think that will be a good step as far as me doing what I feel like I can for people who are disenfranchised. 80% of heart disease is preventable. People don't know that. 20% of it is genetic. So if by changing our lifestyle, we can prevent a lot of heart disease, why aren't we teaching people this? This is what I wanted to use my platform to do. That's exactly what you're doing. I mean, so you guys definitely go check out um, Dr. Heckler's um, various socials, right? Um, you know, Instagram, TikTok, right? LinkedIn, every YouTube, you know, all that stuff. Go check it out because these, first of all, the great quality videos. So kudos to you. The the quality of videos is phenomenal. The shout out to my, my cameraman, my videographer. <laughs> hey, shout out, shout out to them. Shout out to them. <laughs> The, the, the content is phenomenal. Very simple stuff. I mean, put out simple stuff that anybody can pick up on. Anybody can understand nothing that, you know, that's, it takes rocket science, something that anybody can just hear and listen to. Um, and the, and the videos just do very well. What, what is the, what is your favorite social media video that you've made so far? Two questions. Number one, what is your favorite? And number two is which one has done the best? And they, they might be the same. I don't know. So you're, you're right. My favorite and the one that's done the best, I think, is I did a day in the life of a cardiologist and I got to, I kind of basically just went through my week and what it looks like for me being a cardiologist. And I had so much fun creating this content because people always ask me like, so what do you do? What do you do? Are you in the OR all day? Like, so I'm not a surgeon. So trying to explain what I do to people can sometimes get lost upon them. So I was able to kind of show them more so, okay, well, this is what my days typically look like. And I, I enjoyed doing that tremendously. And it translated into it being probably my, one of my number one videos and most watched on TikTok and on Instagram. I love that. Um, specifically, obviously, for the next generation, right? So kids can get that glimpse, that inside look, and, and, and see what that looks like. Um, all right, so a couple of things here to wind it down. The first thing is, real quick, drop your social media handles so everybody knows how to find you. Oh, yeah. So Instagram, the black doctor, T H E B L A C K D L C T O R. TikTok is the black doctor, T H E E. And then YouTube, I just started my YouTube journey, so y'all help me. But it's the black doctor TV. All right. Y'all, y'all go check them out, man. The black doctor, the black doctor, and the black doctor TV. You guys definitely mm -hmm. go check it out. All right. Now, a um, few more things happening here. Number one, viewers, a. Hey, Shout out to you guys for watching. Dr. Hackler's got some great stuff that you guys soak it all in. Now, do us a favor. Hit that subscribe button down below, right? We want to grow grow the channel. He just, he just got his YouTube going. We're trying to get our YouTube going, right? We're trying to be consistent and bring you guys some good quality stuff. So hit that subscribe button. All right, and YouTube's going to show you some videos around here somewhere, the little boxes. Click on that box. YouTube is showing you that box because YouTube knows what you watch, and they're saying, hey, you're going to like this video. So go ahead and click on that video and enjoy it. And then the last thing is for you, Dr. Heckler, to end this episode by saying, my name is Dr. Eddie Heckler III, if you want to say that, and I am a black man in a white coat. 
My name is Eddie Hackler III, and I am a black man in a white coat. I don't wanna go get it, stop playing around. Really got the racks, I ain't playing around.